Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Today we're going to talk about recipes, which we've talked about before on this podcast, but to, it's going to be a little bit different. First, though, we want to say a quick thank you to our latest Patreon supporter, Jacob Pikarski. Thank you so much for supporting us, and to anyone else who'd like to join, you can find a link to our Patreon in our description. Thank you again for everyone who supports us. Thanks. Today's episode is a little different. It's our talk from the Intelligent Speech Conference that took place online back in June. It was a day of great panels and talks, and a wonderful chance to hang out virtually with some of the best educational podcasters out there and the great listeners who make up the audience. So we put together a talk for the event that was based on a video we made a few years ago with some additions. It's about the word recipe and, as always, the connections that go beyond it. No cocktail, though. If you want to see the images we showed on a slideshow during the presentation, you can follow the link in the description to the video version of this talk on YouTube. So without further ado, here's our talk. Recipes and Authority, from Medicine to Magazines. Uh, so we'll start as we normally do. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. <laughs> and we're with the podcast The Endless Knot, which is about language and history and connections between them. And what we're going to do is we've got to we'll give our talk and then we'll do questions. Um, we'll be going back and forth. Uh, we did think about doing like a little dance where we come in and out of the screen, but I think we'll just do it straight. Um, please ask any questions as you go along and we'll try to catch them up at the end. All right, so I have to share my screen, so give me a second to do that. And we will go with, oh, we will just go with that. Okay, sorry. There we go. Share that and start the slideshow. Okay, so today the word recipe means instructions for preparing food. And there's a thriving industry in recipe books that tell you how to cook the right kinds of food in the right way. As we'll see, the idea that someone with authority is telling others what to do has indeed been at the root of the word recipe since the beginning. But as we trace the history of the word and related concepts, we can also see a shift in ideas about who has authority and start to find traces of other voices coming through. Originally, a recipe was a medical prescription. The word recipe is the imperative or command form of the Latin verb recupera, meaning to take. So, recipe, take. That's how it was uh, first used in English, too, in the 14th century, as a verb, not a noun. The instruction at the beginning of a prescription, sort of like, take two aspirins and call me in the morning. We still sort of have this usage, if only in the form of the abbreviation Rx, uh, which was originally an R with a slash through it to indicate it was an abbreviation, which still appears at the start of medical prescriptions. It was only in the 16th century that the word recipe went from being the instruction at the start of a prescription to being a noun that meant the prescription itself. And it was only in the 17th century that the word began to be used to refer not only to medical instructions, but culinary ones too, uh, an appropriate transfer if you think uh, of instructions like take two eggs and so forth. Interestingly, that Latin verb recipera also gave English, through French, the word receipt. Um, but instead of the imperative, this word is formed from the past participle, so meaning taken. Early on, it too could be used to refer to a uh, medical or culinary recipe first recorded in the culinary sense in reference to a recipe for Hippocrates, a kind of sweetened wine uh, in 1595. So this use of receipt actually predates the use of the word recipe in this sense. Today, of course, the financial sense of receipt dominates and the culinary sense has died out, though you may still see it in older writing. So a receipt used to be a recipe, a recipe used to be a prescription, and yes, a prescription used to be something else as well. Before the word prescription gained its medical sense in the 16th century, it used to have a legal sense referring to the right to something through long use. And before that, the Latin word prescriptio meant literally something written before, from pri, before, and scribera, to write. 
So referring to a preface or introduction. And this element of writing is crucial to the idea of recipes, whether medical or culinary. An oral tradition of instructions about cooking must date back to the very origins of cooking itself, but the first written recipes we have date back to ancient Mesopotamia, and the first surviving cookbook is Roman, credited to Apicius in, it's probably not actually his name, but credited to him in first century CE. The European tradition of cookbooks restarted in the late 13th century, and you should listen to Kevin Stroud's episode from the History of English on the form of curry to learn a lot more about recipe books in medieval England. But as you'd expect in a society where literacy rates were low, the first cookbooks were for the upper classes, with instructions for producing the most lavish and exotic feasts for uh, dishes for banquets. The earliest printed cookbooks included a number by famous cooks whose services were in great demand, most of whom, if not all, were men. Writing implies and embodies a certain type of authority, and these books were very much about experts telling the reader what to do. In the late 18th century, the rise of the middle class and later the Victorian uh, emphasis on domesticity led to cookbooks focusing on home management. And these were mainly written by women. The first cookbook written and published in the United States was in 1796 by Amelia Simmons. The first modern cookery writer and compiler of recipes for the home was Eliza Acton, whose modern cookery for private families in 1845 was aimed at the domestic reader rather than the professional cook or chef. This immensely influential book established the format for modern writing about cookery. In 1866, the domestic cookbook was published by Melinda Russell, a free black woman. And in 1881, Abby Fisher, a formerly enslaved woman, published What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking. These two works were the first cookbooks published by African Americans and document a much longer tradition of black cooking in the US, generally known now as soul food, that had been passed down orally since the enslaved people were often forbidden to learn to write. Abby Fisher dictated the recipes in her book because she couldn't read or write. By publishing books, these women were claiming a type of authority long denied to them. Indeed, recipe books historically were one kind of authority, but there has always been another thread of the authority of experience. That is, generations of primarily women who learned cooking from relatives. One place that this usually hidden tradition can be seen is in the marginal annotations, corrections, and notes in family cookbooks, where someone had added their own experience to the authority of the cookbook author. This kind of annotation, combined with the way that early recipe books preserved originally oral knowledge, makes those volumes invaluable sources for parts of society whose voices we too rarely hear. One thing all these early cookbooks had in common, by the way, was that they included non-culinary recipes too, for home remedies, cosmetics, and household products that overlap, uh, uh, sorry, uh, that overlap between medical and culinary recipes that we saw in the origins of the word itself is in fact tied to historical attitudes towards the role of food and medicine. After all, whether it's chicken soup for a cold or a spoonful of cod liver oil to ward one off, food was often considered a remedy for disease. So let's explore that connection between food and medicine and disease, which was the word disease was literally dis-ease or comfort discomfort, uh, as early Europe and the Western world didn't have the germ theory of disease, which only became, became the standard way of thinking in the 19th century. The word disease came into English from Old French. The first element, dis, is a negative prefix, and the second element, es, meaning ease or comfort, and also opportunity or elbow room, is of unknown origin, possibly from a Celtic source, or possibly from Latin ensa, handle, used figuratively in the sense opportunity or occasion, and maybe also elbow, because Latin and satus, furnished with handles, was also used to mean having the arms akimbo. In the ancient world, for the Romans and the Greeks, maintaining health and avoiding disease was all about maintaining proper balance, a concept not unique to Europe, but found in different forms in many traditional medicines around the world. And this came under the heading of diet, which for the Greeks had a rather broader meaning than our usual Eng than our English derivative. 
Greek dieta meant the way of living or the mode of life, including not only what one ate, but also other factors about one's life and environment. The word dieta in turn comes ultimately from a root meaning to take or handle from a Proto-Indo-European root I that means to give or a lot. Note the parallel to the etymology of recipe. And this root also gives us the word etiology, which in medical circles today means the cause of disease. In other words, what gives you a disease. But for the ancient Greeks and Romans and later on the medieval physicians, who, what gives you a disease was imbalance in the body. And so what cured disease was what you take into the body, loosely speaking, your diet, hence those recipes, the give and take of pre-modern medicine, you could say. This ancient no notion of balance can be traced at least as far back as the famous Greek physician Hippocrates and his followers, and came to be called humorism. No, not what's funny, though we do get the modern word humor from that but the bodily humors or four fluids in the body that were thought to regulate everything. The Greek word for humor in this medical sense was humos, meaning literally juice, and coming from a root that means to pour, which also gives us words such as gush, gut, funnel, and fondue, along with a host of other words. The four humors were, tie the four humors were held to be blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. These were in turn associated with different seasons, elements, organs, qualities, and temperaments. This is why we get the terms sanguine from Latin for blood, choleric from the Greek for bile, melancholic, literally black bile, and phlegmatic from a root meaning to burn. If you were thought to have an imbalance of these humors in your body, you would suffer from one of these temperaments. However, this could be treated with a particular food that was thought to share the qualities of the opposing humor. Warm and moist for blood, warm and dry for yellow bile, cold and dry for black bile, and cold and moist for phlegm. Thus, by eating the right thing, you could put your system back into alignment. But of course, you had to take into account the time of year, the cooking method, the geography, the climate, uh, and so forth, as these factors would also influence the cure. Remember, diet isn't just food, but a way of living. And, and the Hippocratic dietary regime would include more than just food, but also sleep, exercise, bathing, and even advice about sex. All these things could influence those essential humoral qualities and thus your health. Now, the Hippocratic Oath, which you've probably heard of, is of course named after that physician, Hippocrates. Also named after Hippocrates is that sweetened and spiced wine, Hippocras, that we mentioned earlier, because Hippocrates supposedly invented a kind of cloth filter bag called the Hippocratic Sleeve that was used to strain the spices off from the wine. And humor, by the way, coming back to that word, is the later Latin term that was used by Roman physicians, such as the influential Galen, who in turn transmitted the theory of the humors to the medieval world. And that's where that notorious medieval practice of leeching came from. Too much blood making you sanguine? No problem, use leeches. That word leech, or lache, by the way, was also appropriately enough an old English word for doctor. Originally two separate and unrelated words, one for the worm, one for the profession, they seem to have fallen together or at least influenced each other. Where either comes from is a matter of some debate, though the physician word leech may be related to a root that means to collect and has derivatives related to speaking and reading. As for the word humor, it comes from a, a root that means wet, so it's ironic, etymologically speaking, that we talk about dry humor. It comes to have the modern sense because the humors were thought to control your temperament, and thus this then transferred to the sense of temperament or mood, and from there to inclination or whim, and that's where we get that funny sense of humor from. By getting back to the diet, in order for food, foods to have the right effect on the humors, they had to be grown or produced in the right environment. So ecology was also an important consideration. And as we indicated earlier, they had to be eaten at the right time of year. Ancient and medieval physicians also put stock in the astrological and cosmological influences on health. It's interesting to note, by the way, that the word cosmological is from Greek cosmos, meaning not only universe and order, but also decoration and ornament, and gives us not only the English word cosmos, but also cosmetic. Now, trust me, this isn't a merely ornamental digression. We'll come back to it soon. So food and diet more broadly was the most important element of ancient medicine. 
But there were two other branches as well that were available to the ancient physician, though both were thought to be more extreme methods. First was pharmacology, which was often just a more concentrated form of food. Certain herbs and spices were used as medicines and culinary ingredients often started out as medicinal. These medicines were thought to have, uh, thought to ha have had the same uh, sorts of effects on bodily humors. The word pharmacy and pharmacology come from the Greek pharmakon, meaning drug, medicine, or even poison. So obviously you had to be careful with pharmacological interventions. We don't know for sure where this Greek word comes from, but it might be connected to a root meaning to cut, from the notion of medicinal plants being cut. But speaking of cutting, the third and most extreme branch of, medical, uh, of ancient medical practice was surgery, which would only be used in dire circumstances as the chances of survival in a time before sterilization and antibiotics were low. The words surgery and surgeon also come from Greek through Latin and French, literally meaning handwork. During the Middle Ages, surgery became divorced from the work of the physicians who were concerned with all that stuff about humors and astrology, and instead was performed by, believe it or not, barbers. Well, they did have a lot of practice cutting things. For the most part, surgery in the hands of these barber surgeons involved the treatment of wounded soldiers. Think amputations and so forth. That red striped barber's pole you might be familiar with represents the blood involved in the barber's surgical pursuits. It wasn't until the 19th century that surgery became firmly part of the realm of the med medical professional. Now these historical overlaps between food, medicine, cosmetics, and even hair cutting may at first glance seem strange to our modern sensibilities, but when you think about it, they never really went away. In the modern drugstore or pharmacy, we find not only medicines, but also food, cosmetics, hair products, and various ornaments. And if we think of the word apothecary, the forerunner of the modern pharmacy, there's the interesting historical accident that from its root, apotheke, Greek, uh, meaning storehouse, literally put away, we also get through French the word boutique, where we buy fashion fashionable clothing. And what's more, before they split in 1617, the London guilds representing the apothecaries and the grocers were one and the same. And of course, the prime reading material you'll find in the modern pharmacy is the women's magazine, a famous example of which, Cosmo, takes us back to that cosmos root meaning order and beauty, which cover topics, these magazines cover topics such as fashion and makeup, health, diet, lifestyle, exercise, sex, recipes, and maybe even horoscopes. The overlap in those ancient ideas of diet as a way of living is still encapsulated in the women's mags of today. And the pharmacy and the women's magazine also demonstrate the gendered overlap of associations with the home and the body. Think home remedies, health, cosmetics, fashion, food, and recipes, all things that women are socially conditioned to consider their responsibility. By the way, the word magazine comes originally from the Arabic word, excuse my pronunciation, magazin, uh, plural of machzan, meaning storehouse. The word came into English through Italian and French in the 16th century with originally the same meaning, particularly a storehouse for military ammunitions. That's why in modern English, the word magazine can still be used to refer to the cartridge car containing bullets in a gun. It wasn't until the 1731 publication of The Gentleman's Magazine that the word was used to refer to a periodical, basically as a metaphor for a storehouse of information. So this is a nice parallel for apothecary and boutique coming from Greek apotheke, also meaning storehouse. In any case, the original periodicals and magazines were written by men for men. And even when such material expanded to be aimed at a female audience, the publishers and writers were generally men. The original mansplaining, you might say. The first women's magazine, though being first published in 1693, it predates the term magazine, was the Ladies Mercury, a spin-off from the Athenian Mercury, which had been aimed at both men and women. It was essentially an advice column to which women could send in questions about love, marriage, behavior, clothing, and so forth, and have them answered by what seems to have been an all-male panel, or manel. Uh, the Athenian society, run by London author John Dunton and his friends, 
Uh, oh, sorry, that was the panel. <laughs> Uh, the Ladies' Mercury ran for only four issues, but it was a start. Several other periodicals aimed at women followed, and by 1770, we come to the Ladies' Magazine. Though still conceived of and published by men, it included female writers and contributors. Indeed, the readership was encouraged to send in their own stories and poems for publication. The content also included society news, but not hard news, which was thought to be only appropriate for men, uh, fashion, and, and music. It also included a medical column written by a male doctor, but uh, covering such topics as breastfeeding and menstrual pains. Though earlier magazines were more targeted to upper class readers, uh, as we come to the 19th century, there were such publications as the English Woman's Domestic Magazine, aimed more at the middle class wife and mother with topics such as cookery and fashion, including sewing patterns to replicate the latest looks, all alongside fiction, poetry, uh, society gossip, sheet music, and other uh, occupations considered appropriate for genteel ladies. This, by the way, was published by Samuel Orchard Beaton, husband of Isabella Beaton of Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management fame, which also wrote, uh, who also wrote for her husband's publication, in addition to being one of the first to establish the standard format of the modern recipe book. Now, as mainstream women's magazines evolved, the late 19th century saw the beginning of magazines aimed specifically at black women in America. Between 1891 and 1950, there were eight African-American women's magazines published for a variety of audiences and purposes. And you will note that I could not find pictures of most of these for this slideshow. I do not think that is particularly coincidental. Uh, it is a much less studied area of uh, publication history. But we had uh, Ringwood's Afro-American Journal of Fashion starting in 1891 that was aimed at providing what they saw as culture to a readership that considered themselves or aimed at being intellectual. While Women's Voice starting in 1912 was one of a group of magazines giving advice to African-American women moving to cities and entering consumerist cultures that focused on fashion and domestic life. Our Women and Children that started in 1888 and African-American uh, Afro -American Women's Journal starting in 1935 were several of a group that attempted to speak to specific political, domestic or religious aspirations on the part of an African-American re female readership. Unlike the predominantly male run white or mainstream women's magazines, all of these were owned or edited or both by black women. But that didn't make them free of the impulse to instruct their readership in how best to live, which sometimes was implicitly or explicitly aimed at getting black women to conform to white standards of beauty, respectability, sexuality, domesticity, etc. This was in part because of, because of class. They were run by elite black ladies who were urging lower class black women to acquire the skills, demeanor, clothing, behaviors, and attitudes that would distance them from their history of enslavement and sexual abuse and contemporary stereotypes about black female sexuality. These days, just to catch us up, we have modern black women's magazines, well, quite a few, but such as Essence, which was started in 1970, founded by four black men who believed in black capitalism as a way forward, but consistently edited by black women, and O, oh, the Oprah magazine, founded in 2000, co-owned by Oprah and the Hearst Corporation, and these focus on fashion, health and wellness, lifestyle, entertainment, and culture. But back in the 19th century, mainstream women's magazines uh, were themselves becoming more explicitly political. The English Women's Journal, which started publication in 1858, discussed and promoted issues such as employment and equality for women. Furthermore, it was founded by and employed women. Today, perhaps the quintessential example of the women's magazine, for better or for worse, is, the, is Cosmopolitan, mostly known as Cosmo now, which, was, which has an interesting history. It went from a general interest family magazine from its inception in 1886 to basically a literary magazine in the early 20th century to a magazine catering to the modern single career woman in 1965 under the direction of editor uh, Helen Gurley Brown who promoted liberated women's issues. It was in its day very progressive publication, even uh, if that's hard to imagine now. 
along with a number of other uh, magazines that were seen as vehicles of female empowerment and, and published many, uh, many, many important feminist voices in the 60s and 70s, uh, like Ms. Magazine and Charlatan, uh, sorry. <laughs> Not Charlatan. Ch Chatelaine uh, here in Canada. Uh, over the last couple of uh, decades, it has retreated from an overtly political stance and focused on telling women what's wrong with them and how consumerism can fix it. A different kind of recipe for a better life, perhaps. In recent years, it seems like Teen Vogue has stepped up to become the new politically oriented women's magazine. Founded in 2003 uh, as an offshoot of Vogue, and initially focused on fashion, it has become increasingly home to radical and political, politically aware writing, especially since Trump's election in 2016, leading the resistance ever since, but without abandoning its fashion and entertainment content. But now that most women's magazines have become a repository for instructions of all types, rec recipes, diet plans, makeup tips, fashion rules, medical information, relationship advice, guides to good sex, and so on, they are essentially selling a recipe for self-improvement and holding out the same illusory promise of balance as those ancient and medieval doctors. If only their readers could follow their instructions perfectly. Perhaps then we have returned to that first definition of a recipe, whether it's for a chocolate cake or a better life. Trust me, I know more than you. Take what I feed you and all will be well. Thanks. there there we go there we go <laughs> so that's it <laughs> thank you very much for uh, that talk very very interesting uh we have a well it seems like it's a, a also a comment here in the question section from david montgomery who says that uh, just to build on the similarities between medicine and food the restaurant was originally not a place but a food a type of bouillon that was thought bought mm -hmm. eh, that was thought in 18th century france to be particularly good for invalids eventually people started creating places where people could go to eat their restaurants which became known uh, as restaurants an interesting comment there and do you have any other historical information on that well, it's it's uh, etymologically connected connected to restore, so it would literally restore you. Very very interesting. So, if anyone else does have any other questions, because we don't have any other at the moment, remember you can just use the ask a question box uh, below, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer. Uh, so, I, I guess I'll come up with a question then, just for now. <laughs> uh, how did you first get into the podcasting business? We, we actually started off doing uh, videos for YouTube, uh, and we thought after doing that for about a year uh, that, you know, we had all this content that we created for YouTube, but we could kind of double dip and <laughs> uh, make it the basis of a podcast. And then it sort of expanded from there. We don't only do that material. We also do interviews and, uh, and just sort of informal chats between ourselves. Uh, yeah, and we would you know, we had, we'd gotten more and more into listening to uh, podcasts and realized that I in particular find it a, a much more convenient thing to fit into my life than YouTube videos because I can do other things while listening to podcasts. And the more we got into it, the more uh, we found the community. So uh, just welcoming and fun and interesting. And so it has made that more and more of a, a focus for us. Um, what was a lot it about of humanity podcasters. What was it about this particular uh, kind of area of study that interested you? Well, you, I mean, Mark's always been the history of language person, that's mm -hmm. something you studied. Yeah, yeah. So I, I look at, I, I work on the history of the English language. Uh, so, you know, I'm interested in etymology and, uh, you know, language change and that sort of thing. And I'm a, my area of study is classics. So I've learned Latin and Greek and I teach it and spend an awful lot of time when I'm teaching those languages, talking about English, in fact, about words in English from 
or cognate to those uh, languages. And then we both are interested in history, classics and medieval history. Yeah, so I, I actually study in the medieval studies department. So yeah, so just the sort of our, our fields, one of the things that the podcast has given us that's been because we both work as professors. Um, and one of the things the podcast has given us is the opportunity to talk about all these things outside of the classroom that doesn't fit the curriculum. So things that come up in class that are just fun. And we have overlaps in our knowledge, uh, but not exact overlaps because we're different periods and different literatures. So it's really just been kind of a fun way to get us to talk about things we know and tell each other things we don't, didn't know, which has been a lot of fun. And uh, it might be a bit difficult, but are there any uh, favorite facts that you've kind of learned <laughs> along your experience that you kind of had no idea or maybe surprised you? Many. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the entire purpose yeah. of doing the research as far as you're concerned, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, doing research is I've got to sort of surprise myself. I've got to find something out that I didn't know before that that kind of made me go, ooh, that's that's really neat. Uh, and so... Is like, there one right now from the, the research right you're now? doing right now? Uh, it's researching the history of the guitar right now. Yeah, the importance of uh, Hawaiian music for the invention of the electric guitar was a bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> and the fact that there was wow. a huge Hawaiian music craze uh, in the 1920s. Wow, yeah, that's something new that I've learned. <laughs> Fairly uh, random, but <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're big on random. Random. So what, uh, another question, I guess. Um, <laughs> what are you currently working on in terms of your research? In terms of my uh, sort of day job research as a, a professor, I'm working on metaphor, uh, specifically uh, spatiotemporal metaphor. So how we use uh, words for spatial things like in front and behind uh, to talk about time. And specifically what hasn't been done in that sort of area of research before is looking at how, how this works with language change. Uh, you know, there are other scholars who compare one language to another in terms of, you know, the languages in the world today. Uh, but no one has really tried to track uh, one of these metaphors uh, from an earlier stage of the language all the way up to today. So that's that's sort of what I'm working on. And I, I my studies has been Latin poetry, but these days somehow, and mostly through my teaching, I've ended up uh, doing a lot of work on uh, gender and sexuality in the ancient world. So I'm writing a couple of pieces right now on Roman sexuality and ideas about sexuality, uh, and also uh, working on some stuff on race and ethnicity in the ancient world, uh, in particular on uh, indigenization of classics curriculums and teaching in Canada. So uh, neither of which was stuff I worked on as a grad student, like it's just, but it, it's come out of teaching. And I think that's one of the things I love most about having teaching and research is that I get to do things that come up in classrooms, lead me in directions I would never have gone. And the same thing happens with the podcast. So I've been, so we have a, a, a couple of recent episodes that involve sex, for instance, because I've been <laughs> writing about sex a lot um, and other things like that. In terms of your videos right now, you're working on, you're writing one on rock and roll and, his, and guitars, mm -hmm. and you're researching for one on gospel and good news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> and one on, on the nation. Yeah, and uh, I've got a podcast episode I'm, I'm editing that's on plagues. <laughs> so, okay. you know. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Uh, another quick question then, I guess, but talk about teaching. The one thing that, that drew you to teaching uh, in the first place? I like to talk. You might have mentioned <laughs> noticed that already. <laughs> uh, I mean, in a way, the weird thing is that when you go to grad school, um, teaching is not why you, well, isn't necessarily why you go, or it's not why you're directed to grad school to do a PhD, and it's not why you're what you're trained in, at least in my program, we were like literally given no training whatsoever for teaching. I was put in front of a class of 200 people and given a like a two-line description of the course and said go when I was a grad student. So um, I kind of, it turned out that I liked it. Uh, I don't know that it's, it's not why I started. I liked the work, the research, the poetry, the topics, the talking, sitting around, talking around with people, but I turned out to be pretty decent at it and to like it a lot. And I think podcasting has been an extension mm. of that. I think for me, it was, I just love researching so much, mm. but it's, it makes it so much more satisfying if at the end of the day, I can say, 
you know what I found out today? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, otherwise I'm just, you know, saying that to her all the time. Uh, so uh, to, to save her from that, uh, that fate, uh, if I have uh, another audience that I can direct that sort of thing to. Um, it doesn't stop him telling me. <laughs> just for the rest. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I wanted to just remark on something that was mentioned in the chat earlier um, that Kathy mentioned about printing requiring people to read and afford a book. And exactly, that was like the, the first... Yeah. I mean, printing made things cheaper than before there was printing, but recipe books for a very long time were only going to be produced for and by and uh, people who had a lot of money. And it's it's only later, it's really, that's why it's at the 18th and 19th century that you yeah. start to get into this middle class kind of cookbooks. And, and then you start getting periodicals because there's finally that the, the price drops enough that people can start to, and there's also a middle class, uh, which didn't exist before. There were some important technological uh, improvements in printing process uh, driven by the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. that allowed for mass printing in the 19th century, uh, which had never really been seen before, like mm -hmm. in terms of just the quantity of books that could be produced. Mm -hmm. But of course, we then lose things too, because as things start to go more and more to a written context, the oral tradition of, of and the sort of individualized tradition of teaching how to cook, for instance, disappears. And not disappears, but it becomes less uh, important. And we see that, I think, in the 20th century with a lot of people who, for, for very good reasons, did not teach their children, their daughters specifically, but their children how to cook, you know, as feminism uh, meant that people could actually do things other than cook for a few minutes. Um, and that's why there's been like this immense boom in recipe books. One of the reasons is that. We, there was a gap in the cultural transmission of how to cook, and people have had to rediscover a lot of that um, using, you know, books, magazines, the internet, whatever. Okay, very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, bring the session to a close now, but it's been very interesting. Thank you for speaking. Just to let the people in the chat know, where can they find your, your podcast? Right, so uh, if you go to alliterative.net, which is, uh, that's our general website. And we have the videos and the podcast there. So alliterative with two L's, um, all endless knot on Twitter. And uh, I think Alliterative it's, uh, on Twitter as well. Oh, so yes. You can find me He's directly. at Alliterative. I'm even Sarah. Um, and then you can go to, you know, uh, alliterative endless knot on Instagram and on Facebook. We did a terrible job of branding. We call our videos <laughs> alliterative. We call the uh, podcast endless knot. It doesn't make any sense. So you just, Find some combination of those two words in most most platforms and you'll find us. And thank you to everyone who came. We really yes, appreciate uh, having uh, some people to talk at. <laughs> As you can okay. tell, we like well, uh, thank you for speaking. It was uh, very interesting. Um, and I will see you all, hopefully, at some point uh, in a later session. Uh, and thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.